today we're looking at tracking performance. I, I've spoken about it before, about benchmarks and the like, uh, and it's one of the things, you know, people we, say, ah, oh, I've done 500% in a share, that's nice, but we need to have a, a much more realistic way of really tracking performance and helping us understand, in truth, are we succeeding? We're, we're investing on our behalf with being a, a do-it-yourself, a DIY investor. You know, what is your return? What is your, your total return? And this is not since you bought the share or since day one. We need to be able to do an annualized return. We need to have costs in, uh, removed out of the equation, dividends bought into it. And of course, the big issue is money that's coming either in or out of the portfolio. So we need to be able to say that we're actually not wasting our time that we actually are doing better than the market. So we've got to be able to track our return to see. The trick is most brokers, certainly every online broker I've looked at, they give you a total return since you bought the shares. And what I mean by that, you know, I, I've got stocks in my portfolio that are hundreds of percent in the green. That's nice, but the question is, when did I buy them? Now, if I bought them a week ago, brilliant. If I bought them a decade ago, a whole lot less brilliant. It also is, you know, what about the dividends that I've received? Uh, the dividends are an important part of, of, of managing a return. And if it's just showing me that, it's not giving me the dividends. It's not saying, what are your dividends? They give you average ent entry price. So we might have those multiple entries. What about money in and out? So it, it really is a case of your brokers giving you a, a single number. We need a portfolio return. We need to be able to say, my 10-year average compound return is 26.5%. Bingo. Then we've got a number. Now we know, hey, we're doing good. So we need to track that annualized return, and we then compare it against a benchmark. For me, preferred benchmark is always top 40 for two reasons. One, I'm a general equity investor, so I'm not specific into financials or, or, or high dividend yields or anything like that. And two is I can buy the top 40. I can buy an ETF. So what makes that important is simply the sense of if I'm not over time beating the index, stop trying, buy the index. Now, a couple of points. You know, on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month, forget about it. I track on an annualized and on a three-year rolling. So at the end of every financial year, I will see how I did in the preceding 12 months and how I've done on average over the preceding 36 months, three years. Question is, did I beat the market? I don't always. Absolutely not. I don't beat the market every single year, but I beat it more years than not. That is what matters. So how do we do it? Simply, we unitize. We manage it like a unit trust. So we essentially turn our own investment into a unit trust. Initially, there's a fair bunch of work. You start the process this weekend, you want to go back, one year, three years, five years, 10 years, there's going to be a fair bunch of work. Uh, and then you plug it into an Excel spreadsheet. Excel is just by far the easiest way to do it. Once we've done that initial work, the only time we need to revisit it is when we add or subtract money from the portfolio and on an annualized basis when we get a new total value for our portfolio. So once that initial work is done, it becomes quick and easy. And we can then get our returns for any period that we're particularly looking for. So what start date? Immediately, I'm going to say, we'll go back to the day you opened your account. <sighs> Probably not, because let's be honest, the first little while of your investing, whether that be days or weeks or months, you probably weren't very good at what you were doing. You probably didn't know the questions and the like. So perhaps find a point where you can say, well, at this point, I became serious. I had myself a strategy and I knew what I was doing. Pick that start date, get a total value of the portfolio from that start date, be it whatever, and then make it into a number of units. How many units? Well, that's entirely up to you. Let's say we've got a 25,000 Rand portfolio. You can do 1,000 units, 25 Rand a unit. You can do 10 units at 2,500 Rand per unit. I like to have my unit values fairly large. I certainly wouldn't want units that were in rand, sort of under uh, 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 10 rand. I wouldn't even want under 100 rand. I would look to do it. Try and find it so that you've got units of 1,000 rand more or less. And that might give you, depending on portfolio size, the quantity, 
but certainly around a thousand rand per unit, I quite like. In truth, it, it makes absolutely no difference. It, it, the units is just how we're going to measure that return. So how do we then change the units? Well, there are two things that are going to change unit prices. The one, quite simply, is going to be share price moves, dividend received, and costs. In other words, within the portfolio. Let's say you do an entire 12 months. You don't add or subtract money. The quantity of units then doesn't change, but the value of units will change. And within that 12 months, there'll be transactions potentially happening, dividends coming, shares being sold and bought, costs being done. All of that's quite fine. But what you want, the, share, the unit price only changes on portfolio value. The unit quantity, that changes when you add cash to the portfolio or remove cash from the portfolio. A question coming through, what if you run multiple portfolios? That's a great point. And what I do, I have multiple portfolios, so I unitize each portfolio because they've got different methodologies. I need to be able to say my momentum system does around 32% per year. My equity system does around 28% per year. I need to know what it is per system because if my momentum was only coming in at at 10% a year, well then can the momentum and put it into the winning portfolio. So unit price changes as the portfolio value increases and decreases. Unit quantity changes as you add or remove cash from the portfolio. So here's just a, a let me make that gone. A random portfolio, I've gone back to June 2010 for no particular reason. Uh, portfolio value, 25,000 Rand. Uh, 1,000 units at 1 Rand, at, at, at 25 units, sorry, at 1,000 Rand unit value. 25 units, 1,000 Rand per unit, 25,000 Rand. So you've got 25 units in your, your, in your unit trust, in your portfolio. A year on, the portfolio, portfolio value has increased. You haven't added any money to the portfolio. But over the course of the year, the value of the shares and the cash within the portfolio increased to 27,500 Rand. That's a 10% increase, as we can see on the right-hand side there, because you still have 25 units. So you divide your 25 units into that portfolio value of 27,500. Presto, your unit value has gone up to 1,100 Rand. That year, you did 10% growth in your portfolio. That 2,500 Rand might have, mean, might have meant zero transactions. You might not have transacted. This might just have been because you were holding the shares and they went up on average 10%. It might have been 500 transactions. So in fact, you, you, you at the end of the year, 2,500 Rand richer. But in truth, there's also money you've spent on transacting, dividends that have come in, profits and losses. None of that matters. All you do year end, end of June, you say, what is port portfolio value? Jump another year, June 2012, a much better year. Portfolio has now gone up uh, some 6,250 Rand. We divide the total portfolio, 33,750. We divide that by number of units, 25. Units are still the same because we haven't added money or removed money. So units remain the same. Value per unit, 1,350 Rand. 12 month return, 22.7%. Total return since June 2010, 35%. And if we jump to June 2013, portfolio slips by 1,250 Rand. Still 25 units. So value per unit, 1,300 Rand. You are down minus 3.7% that year. So in this entire example we're looking at here, there was no changes in terms of money that you, you didn't add any money, you didn't subtract any money. You started with 25,000 Rand, you're at 32,500. That extra, that growth is purely on dividend flows and growth in the value of the portfolio. No money was added, no money was subtracted. Does that there make sense for everyone? Because I'm going to go on to, in, a, in the next slide, how we add and subtract money. But if you've got any questions, toss them in quick now, and we can take them. Otherwise, we'll head on to the next phase. 
Brilliant. No questions. Either everyone's dozed off or we are brilliant. We'll go with the brilliant version. So what happens when we move money? Now let's go back to that June 13. Remember we had a portfolio of 32,500 Rand, 25 units, unit value 1,300. That's taken from the bottom line of that slide there, June 2013. What we do is in the same month, we add some money. We add 5,200 Rand into the portfolio. Now I'm keeping the numbers nice and round so that the process is simple. We add 5,200 Rand, we divide that amount by the current unit value. So what I've done here, I've done this on exactly the same day I valued the portfolio. Units were 1,300 Rand, therefore I add four units. I now have 29 units in my portfolio, value per unit still 1,300. Your portfolio value has gone up, but your quantity of units does not change because the portfolio value went up because of inflows, not because you were removing money. We jump another, <clears throat> uh, you can just see there that whilst the portfolio has increased, the unit value did not increase because as I said, we were not adding, we were only adding cash. We go to September, and what I've taken the assumption here, and it, it's a nonsense assumption, but bear with me for process of making it simple. The assumption is, is that there was zero change in the value of the portfolio. Because if there had been change in the value of the portfolio, we would have had to rechange the unit price. But we say, okay, we needed to withdraw some money. So we took out 13,000 Rand from the portfolio. 13,000 Rand is 10 units. 13,000 divided by 1,300 per unit, 10 units. Our units therefore drop from 29 to 19. Value of portfolio drops to 24,700. Unit price stays the same. So the only thing driving my unit price is a change in portfolio value. Correct. Uh, Niels is asking, Niles is asking, if not 5,200, I'd have fractions of a unit. And absolutely, I, I track units down to a thousandth of a point. So I'll have 10.572 units. So if I'd put in, uh, 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 let's make a simpler one here. Let's say I'd added, instead of 5,200 Rand, let's say I'd added 520 Rand. 520 Rand would have given me extra 0 0.4 units. My units would have gone to 25.4. As I say, I track it down to, to, to uh, a thousandth of a point. That is almost certainly overkill. But in this day and age of Excel, that's probably, it makes no difference. I could go to as many decimal points as I wanted. I go to three death points after the decimal. The thing being is that particularly as a portfolio gets bigger and larger and larger, let's say my unit values get to, in 10 years time, let's say my unit values are now sitting at 100,000 Rand each. That's not impossible. Then those, 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 those decimal points really matter. Of course, what you could do is a share split. So I've got at the bottom here, I've got 19 units value 1,300 Rand each. I could do a 10 for 1 split and give me 190 units at 130 Rand each. See what I did? Increased units by 10 times, decreased value by 10 times. So you can do unit splits if you want. Quick recap, we do have to track our performance. We need to know how we're doing. We need to know which of our systems perform better. And you know what I said earlier, that if my moment, momentum was doing 10%, I would chuck it in and put the money into a different system. Absolutely. But the fact that I've got some systems at 28%, some at 32 and and some at 37 I don't go and collapse it all into the 37%. I don't rush everything into the highest return. The 37% one is higher risk, it's trading uh, uh, futures and the like, and there's, there's a, a much larger a point of risk there. It's only if I was over a protracted period underperforming the market or massively underperforming myself.
if, 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 if I'm doing 28% of my equity, the market's doing 16, but one of my portfolios is doing 17%. You know, I'm beating the market, but I should seriously consider getting rid of that 17% portfolio because it's just not, it's not beating the market by what my better and straight equity, so lowish risk portfolios are doing. Pick a start date. As I said, probably not back to the day you opened your account. Give it some thought, spend a couple of days thinking about when did I really start to do this seriously? When did I sit down and, and have a bit of a plan and a bit of a strategy and the like? And go back to that point in time. Those first weeks, months, maybe even years that you had an online account might have been completely wild and woolly. So let's kind of abandon those, put those down to school fees and move on. And then you adjust units every time cash moves in or out and unit value at the year end. And every time you move cash in or out, you need to revalue the unit. So if I wanted to withdraw money from my portfolio today, I would have to get a, a portfolio value. Therefore, from that, I get a unit value, and then I can withdraw at that particular price. Process is quite simple, simple to understand, simple to do. As I said, right up front when you first start the unitizing process, it is a, a, it's a fair chunk of work at that initial point. It absolutely is. It then becomes significantly easier. Once you've done the first bit of work, I mean, it, it could take you a day or two per portfolio. It depends. The key point is money's flowing in and out. But you go and get your, your, your statements from your stockbroker, download all of those, and just start working from that. The actual transactions don't matter. Question coming through, uh, what about cost of transactions? They're included because what you do is your, your total portfolio value, that's taking into account cost of transaction. You bought a share, 10,000 Rand went into the shares, and 100 bucks went into cost of transaction. Your portfolio has, has, has accounted for that 100 Rand that you no longer have in the portfolio. So the costs are already there. Ah, here's a great question. Folks, if you've got questions, drop them into the Q&A box. Great question coming through there. What about your total expense ratio, your TUR? Short answer, yes. You need to track a TUR. That's a, a, a different game, and I'm going to do a separate video for that. Your expense ratio is, in essence, over the course of a year, add up all your expenses. That would be your trading fees, transaction fees. That would be your admin fee. That would also be data fees. That might also be computer and software fees. So you add your fees up and you say, what are the fees costing me as a percentage of my portfolio? The trick with that is that if your portfolio is anything under 100,000 Rand, your total expense ratio is probably going to be at least 1%. Um, so our total expense ratios are typically fairly high, but they're included in our total return. So when we look at our total return, our total expense ratio is not an issue in that sense. Question coming through, do, do I have a, a default uh, a spreadsheet? Um, I have a spreadsheet. I suppose I can pull the numbers out. Um, sure, I'll put together a spreadsheet. I'll stick, I'll stick it out in the uh, uh, newsletter. Fumani, okay, Fumani, you're also asking about a, 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 a template spreadsheet. Let me say I will put one together. Um, I'm away this weekend, so I will try and get it uh, ready in time so when the newsletter goes out on Monday, it would include a link to the spreadsheet. If not this Monday, then certainly next. Um, and of course, I'll put it on, on Twitter and, and links to the, from the page and everything. I'll put one together for it. Obviously, you're going to have to go and do all the PT for it, um, but I'll put together a nice and simple spreadsheet where you can just start plugging numbers in for yourself. What did you start with and the like? And I'll run it back uh, a number of years, and then you can run forward from there on. Uh, Nico, how do you compare your portfolio to the benchmark and how can the benchmark also include costs and dividends? Uh, Nico, good question. So that's why I say I use the top 40, but I actually use uh, Satrix 40. Um, the reason I use Satrix 40 is because if I look at the top 40, that excludes dividends and my portfolio obviously does. So what I do is what was Satrix 40 on the opening price first day of the financial year? What was it on the final day of the financial year? And what dividends were paid over that 12-month period? So I include the dividends in. So say the, the, the benchmark went from 
uh, 20 Rand to 22 Rand. That's a 10% move. Let's say they gave us one Rand dividend. That would have added an extra 5%. So that total move on the index would have been 15%. I don't take costs into account on the benchmark. In truth, I should. Because if I were to quit my trading and, and, and my own investing and move into the Satrix 40, for example, there are costs. There are obviously costs up front of transaction. And then there are annual management fees uh, of, depending where you hold it and the size, probably 0.8% and downwards. Um, so total cost is probably going to be around 1% uh, per year and less. And to me, you know, if I'm, if I'm, fighting 1%. If the index is doing 16 and I'm doing uh, 17 or 15 and you know we, we, we're worrying about the 1%, then frankly I can't help thinking for the amount of time I put into it. And even if it's only a couple of hours a month, for the hours I put into it, I'm probably not getting bang for my buck. So I ignore the costs, but I do take into account the dividends. What about a trading portfolio? Exactly the same. And although on a trading portfolio it sounds a lot more complicated because there are a lot more, potentially a lot more transactions going through. In truth, again, you just need snapshot value of the portfolio. So let's assume that there is no money going in or out. You don't add money, you don't take money out. All you do is you take a value, a total value of the portfolio of the first day of the financial year, and you take a total value of the last day of the financial year, and that is what the increase in unit value has been. So from that point, really respective. Uh, question from Gavin. So if some stocks in your portfolio are not in the top 40, it does not matter. Same principle applies. Gavin, my answer is yes, but then you got me thinking a whole bunch here. Um, so I answer yes, but then I say, well, hang on a second. That's a good question. My first thought is, well, shouldn't we then benchmark a blend of top 40 and mid-cap portfolio? My second point is maybe we should actually benchmark against the all share, which is about 162 stocks. The point is, is that from my experience, all share and top 40 have a very, very similar uh, uh, move. There might be changes in the fractions. But, but broadly, notwithstanding the all shares, 162 shares, the top 40 is only 40 shares. The point is the top 40 is more than 90% of our market. But to your question, if we are massively skewed to small and mid caps, then perhaps we should look at a mid cap uh, index as our, as our benchmark. Um, and two points on that. I think it's not a bad shout. And there is a mid cap ETF now from RMB. Uh, RMB MID is the is the index. Um, I, I I think it's a great idea. I I've probably gone to top 40 without thinking about it because if I look at the stocks that I hold, now that I think about it, I mean there are a couple not in the top 40. So Clover, um, City Lodge, neither in the top 40. Uh, Calgary M3, not in the top 40. But otherwise, the balance of my holdings. ShopRite, MTN, Woolies, Billiton, um, and so on, Old Mutual, are sitting in the top 40. So I'm probably skewed towards top 40. In my momentum, I've always benchmarked top 40 because I only ever had a top 40 fund, but now I'm doing a mid-cap, so I will benchmark the mid-cap against the mid-cap index. So there will be a different benchmark in that space. Folks, not seeing any more questions coming through, uh, so I will park it there. I will get together a spreadsheet as soon as possible, put it on Twitter, Facebook, and I'll put it out in the newsletter. And as soon as it's ready, I'll also put it on the page at which the video will be displaying. Uh, that video will be online late today or tomorrow. Uh, hopefully my internet's back. It seems that my backup internet worked uh, for the webcast, so we're in business there. Apologies for the slight issue with lack of slides up front didn't detract, we will fix it for the video. Uh, thank you all very much for your time. All the best. Cheers.